Good morning, good morning. Uh, again, my name is Kurt. I uh, serve as one of the pastors at U Flourish Church in, in the city of Milwaukee. It is an honor and a privilege uh, to be here with you guys. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me uh, here this morning. Um, as, as I was putting a, a, a sermon together, I thought back to uh, some, some time ago. Um, I remember calling in uh, to work. Um, well, no, I didn't call in. Actually, I requested a day off, and, and that day had it, it finally came. And when that day had came, I noticed I had a bunch of voicemails that was left from my boss, and I couldn't understand why, because like this, this was my day off, so I listened to all these voicemails, and he's wondering why I'm not at work. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I, I'm, this is my day off. Why is he calling me on my day off? And, and I think to myself, I'm saying, well, I, I think I better go in because I want to make sure I don't get fired. Um, so let me go in and figure out what's going on. And, and, I, and I get in, and he tells me, like, well, you know, you're not off today. You requested a different day off. I'm like, no, no, I didn't. And, and we get to going back and forth with one another, and all of a sudden it starts getting a little louder, and other employees are starting to hear and see what's going on. And we're just going back and forth, and I just don't understand why is he doing this to me. He know I requested this day off, and, and yet he, he wants to punish me for uh, not being at work on the day that I requested off. And, and again, it's getting more and more heated, and all of a sudden I just blurt out, you must be a racist. And the look on his face was not one of anger. It was probably uh, one of the most disturbing looks I had ever seen in my life. And, uh, you know, so I went home that day. Uh, I worked that day and went home that day, and I looked at my calendar. And sure enough, I requested a different day off. <laughs> and let me say, uh, that was the most uncomfortable feeling I'd ever experienced in my life. One of the most uncomfortable feelings. I mean, it challenged my comforts to, um, you, you know, no, no question. Uh, it was the most uncomfortable moment in my life. It challenged all of my comforts. And let me just say, is that not what the gospel is to do to us? Is it not supposed to challenge our comforts? And too often we find ourselves desiring a comfortable gospel. Uh, and, you know, interesting thing, people be more apt to believe a comfortable lie than to deal with an uncomfortable truth. Uh, today, uh, we're going to look at a story about a lawyer who this very thing, exactly what happens, his, his comfort, his challenge. And as we approach this today, my challenge to each and every one of you is that we don't look at this lawyer and begin to start casting judgment, but if we can see, if we can find a little bit of ourselves in this lawyer. And so the, 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 the first uh, point that we're going to uh, find in this passage today is that the gospel is that it challenges our comforts. The gospel challenges our comforts. And today we're picking up in Luke 10th chapter, we'll begin in the 25th verse, but before we go there, uh, may we go to the Lord in prayer. Um, God, you are good. We love you. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for your love, for your kindness. God, we pray above all that you would speak. And God, we pray that you will anoint our ears to hear everything it is that you speak unto us, God, and we pray that you will anoint our hearts to apply all that it is that you would speak unto us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, picking up Luke 10, beginning in the 25th verse, and it reads, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers 
of his word. Now, uh, what's transpiring here, Jesus had sent out the 70, and the 70 had came back, and they're excited because, you know, even the demons were being submissive to them in, in the name of Jesus. And, and so they're having some dialogue back and forth, and up comes this lawyer who wants to put Jesus to the test, and he, and he asked him a question that Quite frankly, he should have known because he's the lawyer, um, and you know, and, and he should know the law better than anyone at that point in time. But 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 he says, "Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life?" And Jesus responds to him. He says, "Well, what is written in the law? Like you are a lawyer, you should know better than anybody else uh, uh, how to answer this question." And so Jesus, he goes back and he asks him one other question. He says, one, he says, what's in the law? But second, he asks, how do you read it? Um, and, 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 and it's interesting that that's, that's mentioned because none of us comes to the scripture with an empty slate. We all bring our background, we bring our culture, we bring the way that we were raised up, we bring uh, former churches that we came from, our, our, our political views, you name it, we bring all of that to the scripture. And so, so it was important that Jesus asked this question. It's like, man, what, you're asking me the question, what must you do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asked him what's written in the law, but secondly, he says, how do you read it? What are you bringing to the scripture? And, and, but, but, but what ends up happening is the lawyer, he answered. He says, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And, and here's the thing. Uh, Jesus, he responds to him and he says, you've answered correctly. And Jesus, he tells him, he says, go ahead, do this and you will live. Seems like easy enough. You know, it could have been over right then and there. He could have said, oh, Jesus, oh, you're so wise. I'm going to do exactly that, and I'm going to go live. No, that ain't. Something else is going on in his mind because he's making the assumption that loving God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength, that you could do that without loving everybody. Uh, and so he responds by saying, he says, desiring to justify himself because uh, there, and, 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 and it was said in the Old Testament, it wasn't written, but it was said sometime in the Old Testament that you could love your neighbor and like hate your enemy. But Jesus came on the scene and he says, like, I actually want you to love your enemies. I actually want you to pray for them. And I, I, want, you to, I want you to embrace your enemies. All of those different things. Jesus turned everything upside down. And, 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 and so this lawyer, he wants to justify himself. And, and he says to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Because in his mind, you know, a neighbor is someone who... Looks like you, a neighbor of someone who acts like you, who behaves like you, who believes like you, who votes like you, and uh, has the same kind of values as you, and everybody else, you know, those other guys on the other side of the aisle, eh, you know, they ain't really Christians anyway. Uh, uh, but, but, but no, no, but he, that, that, that's not the way exactly the way it works in the kingdom of God. And, 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 so, and so because he desired to justify himself, he asked the question, who is my neighbor? And so what we find, this is, ends up being a very uncomfortable situation for the lawyer because it's uncomfortable to believe or to think that somebody that's on the other side of the aisle, I'm supposed to account for as being my neighbor. And so we find that the gospel, not only does it challenge our comforts, the second point that we're going to find is that the gospel, it challenges our culture. And let's pick up in verse 30. Look at how Jesus replied. It says, Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. It says, now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, the Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, 
pouring on oil and wine. Then he sat him on his own animal, and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Again, may the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. And now in Jesus' fashion, he responds to the lawyer in a parable. And, and he, he begins speaking this parable and he talks uh, to, to an audience who understands everything that he's getting ready uh, to speak. The road to Jericho was known to be a very dangerous uh, uh, road. And, and so Jesus, he, he begins speaking this parable. He says, a man, he's, he's traveling down Jericho and the assumption is that this man is a Jew. And he says, he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed and leaving him for half dead. And now Jesus begins to speak on what happens next. So you see a Jewish brother beat left half a dead on the side of the road and a representative of the Jewish church, the priest, comes by and he sees his brother from his own culture left on the side of the road half dead and says, what did Jesus say he did? He said he went to the other side and I'm sure that he had every reason of why it was necessary for him to tra- move over to the other side. Of the, of the road. Well, you know, it's dangerous out here. It could be a trap. He could be pretending like he's hurt, and then as soon as I go over there and get him, you know, he's, he's, he's going to stick me up. Or, you know, I, I really want to get home to my family today. Uh, yeah, I mean, all kind of reasons of why not to help. And it's interesting because here's a representative of the church who sees someone in a terrible condition, and guess what? The representative of the church leaves him in the condition that he found him. That's not where it ends. Jesus brings in someone else, which is a representative of the church, a Levite. Uh, It says a Levite comes and he sees his Jewish brother from his own culture laying on the side of the road, beat, half naked, stripped, left for dead. It says the Levite, when he seen him, says when he seen him, says he crossed over to the other side. And I'm sure that he had many of the same excuses as the priest did. And again, you see, your, your, your brother from your culture left on the side of the road, left for dead, and, uh, and you cross over to the other side. And again, so what we see, representative of the church, sees someone in a terrible condition and walks to the other side. And so the audience that's listening, they're probably picturing their head, well, okay, Jesus is telling the story. The priest didn't do it. The Levite didn't do it. You know what's going to happen next? It's going to be just your everyday common Jew is going to come and he's going to save the day. No, that's not who Jesus entered into the story. Jesus enters into the story someone who is hated, someone who is despised. You see, Jews hated Samaritans so much. If the quickest way to point A and point B was just straight ahead, They would walk all the way around because they hated the Samaritans just that bad. Actually, there's some scholars who would say that rabbis refused to allow uh, midwives to help assist Samaritan women having uh, 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 children because the last thing that the world needed was another despised Samaritan in the earth. And so... Jews hated Samaritans, and, 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 and it wasn't so much that the Samaritans hated the Jews, it was just the Jews did not like the Samaritans whatsoever. And so for Jesus to be talking to a, a Jewish audience and enter in a Samaritan it was probably blowing everyone's mind. So Jesus says in verse 33, he says, but a Samaritan, he says, as he journeyed, he says, when he came to where he was and when he saw him, all he had to do was see him. It said he had compassion. He saw the condition and he had compassion. Why? Because there's something in him that's driving him that's, that, that, that's much different than the first two that was. And, and it says that, that he, he came to him and he bound up his wounds and said he poured 
his expensive oil and his wine on his wounds, and he put them on his own animal, and he brought them to an inn, took care of them, and he could have came to this man. It's like he got just exactly what you deserve. This is what you get for hating us uh, for no reason at all. You guys hate the Samaritans, and guess what? Now, people from your own culture has beat you, bruised you, and battered you. You should have got what you— That wasn't his response. His response was compassion. His compassion drove him to act and respond in ways that people in the man's own culture would not. Since the next day, he said he took money out and he gave it to the innkeeper and told the innkeeper, if there's anything else that drives this man Bill up, like, I'll come and take care of it. Didn't know him nothing. He just saw humanity on the other side, and he allowed the impact of God's love to drive everything. And let me just say, uh, tell you a little bit about my story. I'm a pastor's kid. Um, my dad was born in uh, Oxford, parents were born in Oxford, Mississippi, 1936. So my dad, you know, they grew up in the South d- during some really, really terrible times. Um, during the Great Migration, they moved to uh, Milwaukee. And, uh, you know, so some of the things that my dad experienced in the South, of course, he poured it into his family. And so there was just the, these, some of these ideas. And, and, and the church that we were part of was a legalistic church. It was like a two-part process to salvation. And I can never finish the second part of the process. And, and I got angry with God. I didn't understand why salvation was so difficult. And I'm like, screw it. And you know, at a very young age, my first leadership position was a leader of a gang at 14 years old. Um, I'm leading the gang in, 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 the, in the projects and in the neighborhood down the street from me. And, 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 and when I grew up, I grew up a little bit older and became a drug dealer. And I started selling drugs actually the same, same year that I started college. And I was selling drugs in the evening, going to school during the day, and, and drug dealing got really good, and I decided to just drop out of college and, and did a drug dealer full time. And, and, and one thing began to lead to another. Again, I thought life was grand until uh, I became a target and then was shot at, robbed three times by gunpoint, uh, some friends of mine were murdered. Uh, friends of mine went to prison. I've just seen a, seen a whole lot of things, but it was the third time that I got robbed that it did something to me. And I remember being told to get down on my knees, and I just figured, if you're being told to get down on your knees, I know what's going to happen next. Uh, actually, I lost a friend, and his dad was, was told to get down on their knees, and they were both executed. And so the same thing, I'm in the same situation. I'm being told to get on my knees, and I'm just like, Lord, forgive me. And I figured that's all I had enough time to say. And when I seen that I was still alive, I said another prayer. I'm like, God, if you can get me out of this situation, I'm done. I'll change my life. And uh, next thing you know, I don't know where I got the confidence from, but I just told the gunman, I'm like, I'm not going to get down on my knees. If you're going to shoot me, you're going to have to shoot me while I'm standing up. And, and that was just enough to have the other gunman say, well, just tell us where the money is at. And I gave them all the drugs, but they wanted money. And so I, I let them, this was on the second story, I let them to the top porch and they let me open up the door. When I opened up the door, the sun never looked so beautiful in all of my life because it appeared to me that I saw the sun in the sun. And, and, and they let me step out on the top porch. And I reached underneath the banister as if I had some money underneath the banister. And just one swoop, I took my back leg and spent around and I jumped off the porch and landed on my feet. Um, I, don't ask me how. It's just amazing what you can do when your life is on the line. And I ran like nobody's business. And, 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 and I did what you're never supposed to do in the hood. I called the police. <laughs> and, 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 and the police show up, and, I, and I, I run back to the house after the police show up, and I've got like 50 cops in the house now, and they know this is a drug robbery. You know, cops are pretty smart. <laughs> they know this is a drug robbery, and, 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 and they're like, oh, now you want to call us. And, and, and so now I'm like, there's still some things in my house that I don't want the cops to find. The robbers didn't get it, and I'm like, I'm praying to God that the cops don't find it. So I'm praying to God again. Here's this guy that didn't pass the second part of your process, but... God, here I am. Like, please help me, help me. Uh, fat, long story short, the police, they finally leave, and, and I knew that God's hand was on my life. I don't know why, I don't know how, but he's, he spared me. 
And so I knew I could no longer sell drugs anymore. I decided I was going to keep my word. He spared my life, so I had to take a job. I took a job working out in Sussex for a pharmaceutical company. I was a delivery driver for a pharmaceutical company, so I'm still delivering drugs. <laughs> but this time they're going where they're supposed to go. And, you know, people still want to kill me in Milwaukee. Uh, you know, every time I hear, like, people, I'm still a target, and I'm just like, I just started spending all of my time out in Sussex, and, uh, and, 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 and my boss, the one that I called a racist, actually, he began to put his arms around me. He asked me to come off the road, come into the warehouse. He made me warehouse manager. He's like, hey, if anything that you want to learn in the front office, if you punch out, I'll train you. And I would punch out and all the other people in the warehouse like, man, I wouldn't work for them for free. They want you to work for free. And I'm like, man, I, I, I'm going to give it a shot. And I, I go into the front office. He trained me on some things. And every time a position opened up, he would put me in that position. And I worked my way up through that company in about a year and a half uh, from a delivery driver to like second in charge in that branch. And I get a call from Jackson, Mississippi. They want me to run 13 branches around the country. We went from the 63rd ranked branch in the country to number one in that period that I was in the front office. And it was all due to the guy who was outside of my culture who put his arm. He wasn't a Christian. He just put his arms around me. God used him. God used him, but he, he put his arms around me and, and he, he helped me get promoted and he, he taught me about stock options, make sure you get yourself a, a bonus before you go. And I got a $20,000 bonus before I went to Jackson, Mississippi. Now, I, I was afraid to even put it in the, a bank account because I never had that much legal money before. <laughs> uh, and so I, I, I go to Jackson, Mississippi, and within two weeks in being in Jackson, Mississippi, I get a knock at the door. And this older white gentleman, and I open up the door, and he's like, I want to share the gospel with you. And I'm like, man, you're wasting your time. I'm a pastor's kid. I already know about the gospel. You should go share it with somebody else. And he asked me a question. If you die today, what would be the reason why you would ask God to let you in? And I'm like, I gave a whole bunch of God awful reasons. And he showed me a passage of scripture I'd never seen in my life. Nobody had ever showed me Romans 10 and 9. Now, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart, God has raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. And I'm like, no, you got to do more than that. You got to do more than that. And he's like, read it again. And I'm like, let me make sure this is a King James Version. <laughs> and sure enough, he had a King James Version. And so now I just don't understand how that passage got in there. I'm like, I know you got to do more. You got to be holy. You got to be righteous. You got to clean yourself. He said, read, read it again. And he left. He left me with the Bible. And, and, and I tossed and turned all that night. And by 4.30 in the morning, I wake up, and I'm like, man, if that's true. And I've been saved since I was eight years old. And I began to cry like a baby because I could not believe out of all of these years living on the outside, wanting to be a part of God's family, that he was with me all along, that he was with me all along. It made sense why the bullet would fly past my head where others didn't necessarily make it. Like God's hand was on me all along. And, and I joined the local church and, and, and the community, planted my first church in 2005. But, but the whole point, the two most important things that ever happened to me in my life happened at the hands of someone who was outside of my culture. And that was my professional career. And that was my spirituality. And so when I say that the gospel, it challenges your culture, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to allow the gospel to challenge our culture. And the last thing that we find that the gospel will challenge is our conceptions. The gospel, it challenges our conceptions. And look at uh, what, what happens as Jesus finishes this passage in verse 36. Jesus, he asked the lawyer, he says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. And the thing that's interesting to me is like this lawyer, he comes into this whole, con he comes into this, this whole conversation with a conception of who a neighbor was. And so after Jesus begins to tell him the story of this hated Samaritan actually being the hero of the story, 
Jesus asked him, like, well, which one proved to be a neighbor? And I picture the lawyer just hanging his head down, and the lawyer never, ever said the word Samaritan. He says, the one <laughs> who showed him mercy. And Jesus' response is the same response that he gave then. It's the same response that he gives to each and every one of us today. He says, you go and do likewise. You go and do likewise and allow the gospel to challenge everything that it is that we conceptualize. And, and, and part of that, I mean, another part of that for me and even uh, my story, uh, my wife and I were uh, planning on moving to Grafton, uh, the neighborhood we stayed in uh, for over 20 years at seeing better days, and I'm just like, man, well, it's time for us to get out of here now and just go find a better community. And we were planting a church. I, I've planted three churches now during my lifetime that, uh, that, that I've actually pastored, and, and we were going to plant our, the, our second church, and, and our church was majority white at that point in time. And, and I remember we did some informational sessions in a predominantly African-American neighborhood, and someone came to the informational session and essentially just drilled into me. I was essentially a black face for a white church, going to make a bunch of promises, and then we're going to leave. The funny thing is me and my wife were planning on leaving. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was still going to be committed to the, to the neighborhood. And, and, and he's just lightening to me, lightening to me, until I finally responded. I'm like, hold up, man. I, I grew up in this neighborhood. I went to school in this neighborhood. I went to church in this neighborhood. And I, in fact, I live right around the corner. And the moment I said I live right around the corner, I heard the world, the world stop because I heard myself say I live right around the corner. And he got off of me that moment. And I went home that night. And I told my wife, I'm like, we can't leave. We got to stay in this neighborhood. She's like, are you sure you heard from the Lord? I'm like, I, I think I am. And so we went from uh, the, the next day, I, I, I came out from behind my fence, started knocking on doors and starting trying to meet the neighbors in the neighborhood. And one thing that I began to realize is like, uh, I, I seen my neighborhood as darkness, but I was like, God called us to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And so I began to uh, listen to the needs and the desires of the residents in the community. And one thing led to another. We began to uh, launch an organization called Bridge Builders. It just began as a grassroots organization. We were, we're not an organization at one point in time to other people want to start getting more and more involved in it. And we began to come alongside uh, residents in that community in ways uh, where the gospel had an opportunity to impact their lives. Just simply with our hands, we would uh, redo uh, fences and garage doors uh, for their, um, painting garages. Uh, and, and it's interesting because there was drug deals that was happening in the alley, but for whatever reason, when you bring 40 white people in the alley in the city of Milwaukee, the drug deals stop. <laughs> So, so uh, and, and, and God's mercy and his grace just continued to just expand. And, and during the time where our country was divided, we were actually bringing people together, urban and suburban, coming together, actually making an impact in the neighborhood in ways that my neighborhood had never seen. And, and again, it goes back to the whole mindset of allowing the gospel to challenge your conceptions. What I saw was darkness that I needed to leave. But what God saw was an opportunity for light to shine in darkness. So ladies and gentlemen, my challenge to you as you leave today is uh, would you be willing to allow the gospel to challenge your comforts? Would you be willing to allow the gospel to challenge your culture? And would you be willing to allow the gospel to challenge your conceptions? Let us pray. God, you are good, we love you. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, God. I thank you for the people here at this church and how you gifted each and every one. And God, I just pray right now, God, that you would move by your power, by your might, God, that even as we leave this place, God, that, that, that the gospel will begin to impact our lives in ways, God, that will uh, impact the spaces and the places that each and every one occupies, God. Father, we uh, embrace this idea that we are the light of the world and that uh, we are the salt of the earth, God, and we just ask that you would give us comfort in that, that you would give us confidence in that, knowing that you are a good, good Father. 
God, and we just love you and we thank you right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Again, I want to say thank you so, so very much uh, for having me here today. Again, it's been an uh, honor and a privilege, and I'd like to get you out of here. I'm just going to ask that you repeat after me. Uh, may the Lord watch between you and I while we're absent one from another. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You are dismissed.